Wisdom. I'm speaking about none other than Dr. Ron Archer, who is our keynote speaker for today. His career began as a speechwriter and a coordinator with a loan executive program, and he also worked with NFL Pierre. The, ladies and gentlemen, the moment that you've been waiting for, the Reverend Dr. Bishop Romano. In 509 BC, great men like Aristophanes, Euripides, Cleisthenes, and Pericles climbed up the Acropolis and met at the Parthenon to start this new existential esoteric thing we call democracy. A society of, for, and by the people. One of the great writers of history, Hegel, began to describe this powerful force where people are able to express their deepest ethnocentric, ideological, pedantic nomenclature and intellectual jargon to be able to shape destiny into reality. He said that truth is not found in a thesis nor is truth found in the antithesis, but that truth is found in the emergent synthesis that reconciles the two extremes. And what that means for us today as we celebrate black history, it means that none of us can be smarter or greater than all of us. It means that we have come over on different ships, but that we're in the same boat now. We either learn to work together as friends or perish as fools, for a high tide can raise all of our ships. <laughs> Nature has been trying to teach us the secret to wealth, success, viability, transcendence, overcoming, living our dreams and not our fears, and how to turn our pain into power, and our wounds into wisdom, and our scars into stars, and our stumbling blocks into stepping stones, and our tragedy into triumph, and our misery into ministry. Nature tries to teach us, if we will learn. When zebra are threatened, they herd. When birds are threatened, they flock. When bees are threatened, they swarm. When fish are threatened, they school. But too often, when people are threatened, they split. And they get destroyed. And if we could study in the serendipitous, pedantic history of antiquity, why has black and Africa been deemed to be less than our other national compatriots, it comes down to this one idea, a division presentation. Man against woman, nation against nation, same color, same hue, same ethnocentric origin, yet we have been fooled to believe that somehow, if I can step on my brother, somehow I become better. This has been the lie since the beginning of time. The two diseases that keep us dysfunctional from being everything we are designed to be are the diseases of envy and jealousy. What is envy? Envy means that I want what you have, but I'm not willing to do what you did to get it. I just want it to fall on me. I'm cute. I'm handsome. I'm smart. I live in this community. I just want good things just to fall. I want what you have, but I don't want to do what you did to get it. I don't want to go to school. I don't want to study hard. I don't want to sacrifice. I don't want to be 
able to live beneath my means so I can someday not simply work at a bakery, but own the bakery. Envy. The second disease that creates division, that harms black history, is jealousy. Envy is, I want what you have. Oh, I want your hair. I want your clothes. I want your car. I want your skin color. I want your family. Jealousy is much worse. Jealousy is envy on steroids. <laughs> Jealousy is horrible. Envy is just a thought. Envy is just an attitude. Envy is just a mental disposition. But jealousy is action. Jealousy says, your success so bothers me. Your upward mobility, your straight A's, your cash, your car, your boyfriend, your girlfriend, your dean's list ability so threatens me, I must find a way to destroy you or destroy what you're doing. That is jealousy. If we are going to be able to turn our scars into scars and our misery into mission and our stumbling blocks into stepping stones, we must first learn to love ourselves. I cannot love anybody else if I don't love me. I cannot give you what I don't have. And you know what the goal has been from other nations about black? is to make you hate yourself. Hate your hair, if you have it. <laughs> My son, Christopher, who is a military officer in the United States, and my son Jason, who's a doctor, they both have a nickname for me. They call me Goldilocks. <laughs> but I have a nickname for them. It's called <laughs> Heredity. <laughs> <laughs> Just keep living, your time is coming. But for anybody who's like me, who's blessed to have a dome, let me tell you the real strength of being bald. God does not put marble top on cheap furniture, baby. Just keep shining. <laughs> Throughout history, the word black has been associated with evil. Black cats, evil. <laughs> when you watch the old cowboy movies, the hero would wear a white suit with a white hat on a white horse, and the bad guy rode a black horse. Evil. In America, when you would eat food, angel food cake was white, and devil food cake was black. We even had a name for black hair. If your hair was black, strong, tight, coarse, it was called bad hair. How can hair be bad? And yet we were described. And the first thing you do to make a people feel self-hatred is to dehumanize them, call them savages. I remember my first trip to China. Years ago, me and my other PhD candidate were in Beijing. We're walking around, one of the very few African American people in the city at that particular dispensation, and I'm shopping, and my other friend is looking in the window, and this elderly Chinese gentleman, God bless his soul, who was kind of hunched over, about 90 years old, thick glasses, walks behind my friend and starts to grab his butt and squeeze it. <laughs> He's squeezing and filling it. So his son runs down the street and says, hey, no, 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 stop, stop. And my friend says, why is he grabbing my butt? He said, I'm so sorry. He's looking for your tail. <laughs> He's been taught that black people were the missing link between apes and humans. And that we all have tails. The first African slaves 
were brought in chains to America in 1619. During that time, black people were called chattel, meaning we were property. We had no rights. No laws protected us. We could not own land. We could not vote. And if you are ever caught reading a book, you'd be lynched. If you try to be brave and bold and protect your family, you might be castrated and burned publicly. To remind us of our inhumanity. Laws prevented us from expanding. In America, there was something called the Homestead Act, where the American government paid white families to leave the East Coast from New York and Chicago and Washington, D.C. and North Carolina to go west, and they would give them land and money, and if they would farm the land for seven years without leaving it, they would own the land and get government loans to buy machinery in order to be able to become farmers. Only if you were a white male could you do that. Blacks could not get that same treatment. So I want you to imagine a society that says we're going to run a race. And we'll have a gun that will signal the start of the race. But if you have white skin, when the gun goes off, you can start running. But if you are black, we put you in a hole. And you have to wait 400 years before you're allowed to run in the race. After slavery ended, there was something called Jim Crow, or apartheid in America for black history, which meant that the government decided through what is called Plessy versus Ferguson that separate was also equal, it was a lie. So in white schools, you had great textbooks. In black schools, you had no books. In white schools, you had great teachers. And in black schools, you had no teachers. But it was separate, but it was equal. It was a lie. And so black Americans got together and said, we have got to change. How do we change? Not by burning down buildings, not by killing people, but by going to school finally and becoming lawyers and becoming doctors and challenging the system and changing these United States through the Supreme Court and through the Constitution and making it a fair society where all men are created equal and are endowed by their creator with certain alienable rights, which are like liberty and pursuit of happiness and Dr. Martin Luther King said, be true, America, to what you put on paper. Live up to your words. And a great black lawyer by the name of Thurgood Marshall brought a case to the United States Supreme Court that said, Plessy versus Ferguson is unconstitutional. Separate but equal is not American, nor fair. I belong to a class within this institute that yeah. is the Seed Women Entrepreneurs uh, Program. Okay. Where many of our women are doing jobs or taking entrepreneurs, undertaking entrepreneurs which are largely masculine in nature. Yes. One of my classmates has 250 buses running in this city. My colleagues, one of them is running a petrol uh, pump selling uh, um, uh, institution. Okay. Others are caterers, big, big, big stuff, big stuff. Yes, ma'am. Catering, selling electronics, doing designs, and so on. So what is So that? now, sir, I wish to just make a comment. Yes. That ability or disability, as, as your presentation has largely stated, ability or disability, I want to agree with you, that it is first and foremost mental. Amen. Whether you can do it 
or you can't wait, it is about you. Whether you feel black or you feel white, it is not the color, it is your faith in you. Do you feel white or do you feel black? So I wish to really thank you for that presentation. Thank you very much. To have the gift of sight, sir, but like you, to possess no vision. That without vision, we become like blind men in dark rooms chasing black cats who simply are not there, spending time wasting and confusing activity with accomplishment. Discover who you are, live life on purpose, and live your dreams and not your fears. I'm Dr. Ron Archer, and I love you because God does too.